Hello and welcome back. Tonight on the bench I have a very special pistol. Now I've been asked several times if there are any pistols other than Colts in this collection. And the answer to that question is yes. There is one and only one non-Colt pistol currently in the collection. Now it was purchased from a personal friend of the owner of the collection and this individual recently passed away on April 19th of 2013. Now I also had the pleasure of knowing this gentleman. He was a senior engineer at an engineering firm that I used to work at and a company that happened to be owned by the owner of the Colt collection that I'm working on. This engineer's name was Fred Nestel. Now Fred was a World War II veteran who would share some very captivating stories of his time in Europe. He said he was an artillery spotter and his company was often on the very tip of advancement through Germany as the war was drawing to a close. Since Fred was an officer, he had a few different occasions where German officers surrendered to him. Because of this, he ended up with some very interesting pieces of German war items. And tonight's story involves one of those items the pistol that is here on the bench. Now I've often said if these pistols could talk the stories they might tell. Well, tonight we get to hear one pistol's story. Now about a year ago Fred was selling some items and wanted to know if the owner of the collection might be interested in buying this pistol. He said he would be interested in buying the pistol and I suggested that he should make sure to get Fred's story written down for future generations. So the owner of the collection visited Fred, and since they were old friends, they talked about old times, for they had known each other for many years. And then Fred told him the story of how he acquired the pistol. But before I tell you Fred's story, let's take a look at the pistol. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this pistol. We will go ahead and we'll start with our holster here. You can see this holster is still in excellent shape, being this how it is 70 years old now. We'll go ahead and we'll pull our pistol out and we'll set it off to the side for the moment. You can see we have a spare magazine pouch here on the side of the holster. We'll go ahead and pull our spare magazine out. And you can see we'll just flip this over, take a quick look at it. You can see it's in excellent shape. Um, stitching still excellent and the leather is still nice and supple. Uh, it's been well taken care of. And then we'll go ahead and take a look here. We have on this inside flap, you can see the uh, German Waffenamp stamp here, which is WAA195. You can see the eagle and the swastika. And we'll go ahead and pull the strap back here. You can see the stamp 43, and I can't tell if this is a stamp above it or not. It looks like there might be a light stamping right there, but anyhow, there's your holster for the pistol. And now, we'll take a look at the pistol. Okay, so now that we've looked at the holster, let's go ahead and take a look at the pistol. The pistol is a VIS Model 35, or also known as a Radom VIS P35. Now, the pistol had its beginnings in 1930 at the arms factory in Radom, Poland, and its name was originally WIS, which is an acronym for the two designers' names. It was later changed to VIS, meaning force in Latin. In 1935, it was adopted by the Polish military as its sidearm, and when after the Germans invaded and occupied Poland in 1939, they continued to produce the pistol until April of 1945. Now, after the war ended, the pistol produ production was never resumed, and the People's Republic of Poland used the TT-33. Now, as World War II progressed, the pistol's design and finish degraded in order to speed up production. By the end of the war, the pistol ended up being very crude. It had lost a few of its parts, and some parts had been changed internally. Now, the pistol itself borrows from two John Browning designs, the Model 1911 and the High Power. So we'll get into that a little bit as we look at the pistol. Some other interesting facts about this pistol is it was being produced by forced labor in occupied Poland 
Labor successfully was able to smuggle pistol parts out of the factory and they were able to assemble several hundred of these pistols that made their way to the Polish resistance. And the resistance used the pistol in various operations, one of them being the Warsaw Uprising. So if you want to learn more about the history of the pistol, I'll leave a link in the description below. Now let's go ahead and take a quick look at it here. We'll start by looking at our roll markings here and you can see the FB Radom Vis model 35 patent number 15567. We have a German military stamp there. We also have another one if I can get in here close enough without losing the focus and the 77 right there which is the code for the arms factory in Warsaw or excuse me in Radom and the one in Austria also you can see there's another stamp here on the frame and then probably the similar marks I'm not quite sure we have a, another couple marks down here and then another one here on the inside of the trigger bow and then we have the FB on the triangle here in the grips which is for Fabrica Bruni which is I guess arms factory and then we have on the other side we have our VIS in the triangle there and then we have our serial number up here W6748 and another stamp here beside it and then you can see this isn't a high polish finish but it's still a pretty good finish on this pistol and you know it looks it looks pretty good as I said I believe this one was produced in 39 to 40 it still has all of its components and the finish is still in pretty decent shape in the low serial number now this has a grip safety on it that's the only safety these pistols had on them and here we have a takedown lever and we'll go ahead and take a look at our sights on this see we just have the blade sight up here and then the rear sight here and then if we can see this hopefully we don't lose the focus on here there's a little bit of nice uh, work here on the top where this was machined out looks good nice little detail there it gives the gun a little bit of a little bit of a nice look now this pistol fits well in the hand and uh, feels pretty good I guess it was pretty accurate and due to its mass it shot pretty well so it's sought after by collectors and there we go now we'll go ahead as I uh, detail stripped this and cleaned it I filmed a little bit of the uh, components on the inside so I'll go ahead and we'll cut to the video of the internal components okay so here I've got the pistol apart I've just finished cleaning it and before I put it back together I thought I would take a minute and show you some of the internal components that we have here and we'll just go ahead and start over here we have our grip screws here you can see it's a very fine thread on these um, careful putting them back in the frame. Here we have uh, a telescoping guide rod. You can see pretty stiff. Feels a uh, good action on that. And here we have the barrel. And you can see this barrel design it looks like it borrows a little bit from the high powers. Uh, I've read that these were a blend between the 1911 and the high power and uh, both John Browning's design. You can see the uh, lever here or excuse me the ledge and how the barrels actually cammed on that instead of a pin and a link as we have in the 1911 design so there's that and while we're here we'll go ahead and take a look we can see the barrel has we get the light on here right there we go we have the uh, last three digits of the serial number here on the barrel and then we also have our German acceptance mark right here see if we can get in there and see that but uh, anyway 
There it is right there. And then we'll go ahead and uh, take a look real quick at our slide here. And you can see I haven't pulled the firing pin out in the extractor. I understand there's a tool required to get that out, and I don't want to damage the pistol since I don't have that tool. But anyhow, uh, we've cleaned this the best we can and gotten oil down in there and taken care of it. And you can see we have a groove that's been milled out here and the corresponding piece here on the frame you can see that sticking up there and then or the hole where the disconnector comes through and so there's that and then there's only one locking lug in this as opposed to like a 1911 with two on the 45 caliber and here's just like the front of our slide and you can see our sights on there and just a good idea of here's our firing pin what this looks like and then as we move along looking at our parts here's our trigger you can see the notches out of the back of the trigger bow here and then uh, just a piece of block no serrations or grooves on the front of our trigger here and then our uh, magazine release catch um, has very similar appearance to a 1911. We'll go ahead and uh, pretty much, pretty much identical in design. And then here we have our slide stop, flat notch on the front of it, and you can see the uh, checkering on it. Hopefully, we can get enough light on there. You can see the detail. As we move along, here we have our takedown lever. You can see how thin this is. I watched a fellow YouTuber's video on how to take these down. The gentleman said to be very careful when you pull on this. This thin metal can sometimes break. Uh, our th three finger leaf spring here. You can see very similar to a 1911. And as we move along, here's our mainspring housing. I've had difficulty getting this apart. In fact, I haven't gotten it apart yet. Um, I'm going to have to make a little jig to be able to get this apart. But anyway, we have our serial number stamped here on the side. And then here's our lanyard loop on this. And then uh, what else do we have here? We have our retaining pin. So it doesn't have a notch in it like the 1911 where we have the corresponding bottom of the mainspring there where it sticks out and it kind of locks it in place. Here's our sear. You see what the sear looks like there? Very square in its design. Um, here we have the disconnector. See how wide the top of it is? And the large loop there. And as we move along here we have just the pin for the sear. Looks like a 1911 one. Same with the the uh, hammer pin, and then here's of course our hammer and hammer strut together, and then last but not least we have our grip safety, and we'll flip the grip safety over, and you can see on the back side of this grip safety, hopefully you can see that it has once again the serial number. Oh yeah, and on the inside of the slide down in here we also have the serial number. And there you go. That's a look at the interior components of our this model 35. So we'll go ahead and uh, put it back together and I'll be right back. Well I hope you enjoyed seeing the internal components of the pistol. Now let's move on to Fred's story. Fred was a first lieutenant in the 29th field artillery that was a unit of the 4th infantry division. The 4th Infantry Division was involved in many engagements during its fight into the heart of Germany. Here are just a few of what it was involved in. The 4th Infantry Division was part of the D-Day landing at Utah Beach. It was also involved in the liberation of Paris. It faced the Germans in the Ardennes Offensive, also known as the Battle of the Bulge. A 4th Division patrol was the first of the Allies to set foot on German soil on September 11th of 1944. So as you can see, they were a very active division fighting the Germans. So how did 1st Lieutenant Nestel come into possession of this pistol? Well, I'll let the statement he left
do the talking. Here are his own words. This is the story of how I, 1st Lieutenant Frederick Nestel of C Battery, 29th Field Artillery, obtained this Radom pistol serial number W6748. It was the very early spring of 1945. My company, C Battery, 29th Field Artillery of the United States Army, was in a location near Ansbach, approximately 20 miles southwest of Nuremberg, Germany, towards Worms. We were notified that we should be prepared as there were enemy aircraft in the area. No sooner than we had received the alert that we saw a Dornier twin-engine bomber come over the hill at about 200 foot altitude with both engines on fire. Several of our company's quad 50 caliber anti-aircraft machine guns opened up on the low-flying plane, riddling it with bullets. All of the crew except for the pilot were killed in this action in the ensuing crash landing. The injured pilot, a German officer, exited the plane. As I was the only American officer on the site, he came up to me and surrendered, handing over his pistol, his 9mm Radom Vis P-35 serial number W6748 in its holster. After handing over his gun to me, he asked me if it would be possible to get a cup of coffee. That is something that I will never forget. And I will never forget you, Fred. Thanks for tuning in and watching. That's going to be it for tonight. Have a great evening.